Hello, and welcome to week eight of the Bring Back the Salmon Classroom Hatchery program. Over the past seven weeks, we've learned about what an Atlantic salmon is, the hatchery process that provides the eggs for the program. We've learned about their life cycle. We've learned about their habitats. We've learned how to identify an Atlantic salmon. We've learned about their native range, how they came to live in Lake Ontario, the importance that they've had for various cultures, and we've learned about what they eat and what eats them. So why are we doing this program? Why are we restoring this species, bringing this species back to the Lake Ontario watershed? A fish once so abundant that you could walk across rivers on the backs of them. A fish once so abundant that you could catch so many that you might break your boat in half due to the weight of the fish that you're catching. A fish that coexisted with the people of this land for thousands of years vanished within a hundred. Atlantic salmon became extirpated from Lake Ontario in 1896. Extirpated means locally extinct. Extinct means they no longer exist. Lake Ontario Atlantic salmon no longer exist. Atlantic salmon still exist in other parts of the world, but other populations of Atlantic salmon have also become extinct. And many other populations are in serious trouble for the same reasons that Atlantic salmon became extirpated from Lake Ontario. Abundant to gone in a hundred years. What happened? People from France and Britain were exploring Ontario throughout the 1600s, followed by European settlement in the mid-1700s. Forests were cut down to make way for villages, farm fields, and industry. The loss of the tree cover over top of the cold water streams caused the water to warm up because it was exposed to more sunlight. Also, tree roots help to hold together stream banks. Without the trees and without the roots, there's more soil erosion. The soil erosion causes more sediment in the water, which can clog fish gills and smother the eggs. Industrialization was sweeping its way across Europe, and it came crashing into the Americas. Moving water is a great clean and efficient way to turn large wheels. And the turning of these wheels can then turn the workings of machines. These machines were being used by the new settlers to cut logs into boards, mill grains like wheat and corn into flour, and to make textiles. To harness the power of the water, Dams were built to hold the water back and concentrate its flow over the large wheels. Now remember that Atlantic salmon and many other aquatic animals need to be able to move from the headwaters of a river system down to the lake and then migrate back up to spawn. Atlantic salmon are great jumpers, being able to jump up to three meters high, but many of the dams were simply too high. These dams are barriers, cutting the connectivity of the river, which kept many Atlantic salmon from being able to spawn. On top of that, the ponds created at the top of the dam slow the water and expose it to more sunlight, which warms it. Like with many of our natural resources, like our forests, the abundancy of Atlantic salmon caused a belief that they were inexhaustible. The fish now massing at the bottom of the dams were harvested at a rate that outpaced their reproduction. Add polluted water into the mix and populations started to decline. Some efforts were made to protect the fish but it was too little and too late. Loss of trees, loss of stream connectivity, overfishing and pollution. Abundant to gone in a hundred years. The plight of Atlantic salmon is sadly not an uncommon story. 
there are over 200 species of plants and animals at risk of becoming extinct in Ontario alone. Globally, that number is staggering, where over 1 million species are believed to be at risk of extinction. Extinction does happen naturally, but the rate that we are losing species currently is not the norm. Now, there have been mass extinctions in the past due to events like asteroid strikes, massive volcanic eruptions, glacial cycles, and changes in ocean and atmospheric chemistry. Many scientists believe that we are in the midst of another mass extinction, the sixth in the history of the planet. And this one is being caused by us. We are polluting the air and water, destroying the soils, over-consuming the resources, changing the climate, destroying habitats, changing the chemistry of the ocean and the atmosphere, and reducing biodiversity, the variety of living beings. Biodiversity drives the ecological services that we and many other living things need for survival. The pollination that enables the reproduction of many plants, including most of our food crops. The cleaning of air and water, the functioning of our soil, the decomposition and recycling of wastes and deceased organisms, and the moderation of extreme weather. Now, before you slip into a state of horror, sadness, and inaction, I need to remind you that there is still lots of health, beauty, and ecological services intact in the world. But it needs us humans to wake up, reconnect as part of nature, Stop being so selfish and start to care. If we do this, we have a long, bright, healthy, and happy future. I believe that we can do this. In fact, this week, I'm going to thank you in advance for the actions that you take and will take and the difference that you will make to help shape a better future. Okay, for our hatchery checks. Got the filter working, the aerator's working. Temperature is sitting at seven. No fish floating around. Oh, there's one sitting outside of the rocks. Looks healthy. Just hanging out there maybe. Okay, and for this tank, oh, our filter's not working. Now I had this off to do some filming and it hasn't restarted on its own. You can see the water going up and down that tube. It's trying to push the air out. So we've got to reprime this pump. We have air. We also have a whole bunch of foam on the top of this water. Wonder what that could mean. Temperature is sitting at five. And our fish are starting to hatch. Not all of them yet, but some of them have hatched. In fact, quite a few of them have. But still a lot of eyed eggs left. Okay, let's reprime this pump. Okay, so to reprime it, I'm going to take the lid off. I'm going to get some water out of the tank. It's the same temperature, it's the same water. And then I just pour that in. That's going to help push the air out. You might be able to see in there that that water level is slowly going up. Right there now. Just about there. So as soon as this this pump start or this filter starts working properly, we're going to hear a presentation from Mary Kate Wibbs from the Toronto Zoo, 
on the programs they have for um, species at risk. And then we're going to hear another fishy facts from Johnny. And there's our filter. Hello everyone, my name is Mary-Kate and I'm the Aqualinks coordinator here at the Toronto Zoo. So I work on a few different aquatic programs, education programs that we have at the zoo. And one of them is our Atlantic Salmon Rear and Release Program that we call Aqualinks. So this is in partnership with the Federation of Anglers and Hunters uh, and the Classroom Hatchery Program to bring back the Atlantic Salmon. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself and a little bit about how I came to be in this position. So I went to university after high school. I studied science. I got a Bachelor of Science from the uh, University at Trent University, rather. And then after that, I actually went back to school and I got a Bachelor's of Education. So I'm also a trained teacher. So through that time, I've always been very interested in science and nature. And I was fortunate to get this position here at the Toronto Zoo in 2010. I actually started at the zoo as a summer student in 2008, so two summers before that. I was out tracking turtles in uh, Rouge Park, uh, and I was doing that for the summer. And then it was right after that that I did Teachers College. And when I finished that, which was the summer of 2009, I came back to the zoo and I did some more education-based programs for the summer. And then it was just a few months after that that I started in, in this position, and I've been doing that ever since. So it's been about 11 years now since I've been doing this role and it's been a lot of fun throughout that time. Uh, and even before I actually got my first job at the zoo, I was a volunteer. So I, I was a zoo volunteer when I was in university for a summer. So I would come and I would, uh, my favorite spot was to be in the America's wetlands. There's a nice kiosk there. And I would hang out there and I would talk to people as they came through about frogs that we would see in the wetland and flowers and different insects and all sorts of things. So that really got me interested and wanting to work here at the zoo in, in different capacities. So that's more or less how I got to be in this particular role. Um, but you know, school and learning never ends. So in 2016, I finished a master's of museum studies. So I got to learn a lot more about how people learn in these informal learning settings, just like the zoo here. So zoos and museums are considered, and science centers are considered informal learning settings. So there's a lot of learning that happens here, but of course it's a little different than in your typical classroom. Uh, I've also taken a lot of courses. So I've taken courses in stream assessment and electrofishing and uh, GIS, so ge geographical information systems, all sorts of different learning uh, that goes on as you continue on in your career, in your profession. So learning never really stops. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, a little bit about me and how I got to be in this particular role. Um, and so what I want to do, I want to show you actually where I'm standing. So I'm in our America's Pavilion, and behind me here are some Atlantic salmon. So these are much bigger than the ones you've seen so far in the video series. These are yearling salmon. So these are our salmon that we had this time last year as little Alvin in our hatchery back in the fish lab, which is where we're going to go after this. So these salmon, are in here with our American eels. Actually, you can see an American eel swimming around. You might see him in the frame at some point. Uh, and so they're all hanging out in this tank together. And we can release them at this age, but for now we're going to keep them in this uh, aquarium so that people can see them when they come and visit the zoo. Because it's not every day that you get to see Atlantic salmon, and not every day that you get to see them at this age either. So of course you already know that uh, the salmon are quite tiny. Right now, this time of year, they're just ha they've just hatched out. In fact, our salmon in the, in the fish lab have just started to hatch out from, from their eggs. Um, and so we're going to go check them out, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our setup here at the zoo, and a little bit more about some of our other programs to help protect species at risk. So I'll see you there. Okay, so here we are in the fish lab at the zoo, and uh, I'm going to be talking a little about our involvement with the Atlantic salmon program uh, in a little more detail. So I won't repeat sort of what Ben has already talked about uh, in terms of setting up the aquarium uh, and the, uh, the sort of the condo for the eggs, because you'll see all of that here. We have basically the same, the same setup here at the zoo. Uh, so we've been involved in the Atlantic Salmon uh, program now for, oh, let's see, probably just over 10 years. So probably since 
but 2008-2009 was when we first started to get involved with the salmon program and uh, with OFH. And so every year we raise salmon in classrooms as well, and, and we have some here at the zoo, and we release them into the wild. So here you can take a closer look at our salmon. So we've got 200 in this top tank here. And we can see that some have hatched out just recently, just uh, over the last couple days, actually. So just like Ben was saying, there's about 100 in each, even though it doesn't look like it. And then we've got another tank down below. And uh, we, I left some of these decorations on it. So this is a piece of insulation from a school that had decorated and put some information on their insulation so that people could learn about the program. So I thought that was pretty neat. So here we got, uh, we've got 100 in this lower tank here. So we have 300 in total here at the zoo. You'll notice there are a couple that look a little different. They're sort of more white in color. Those ones are unfortunately dead, but we do expect that to happen. Expect to get the odd one. But the idea here is that we're raising these salmon in captivity and we're giving them a good chance of survival uh, by getting them through these very early vulnerable stages of life and helping them survive that and then releasing them back into the wild. So one of the things we do here at the zoo is uh, we sort of add an extra component onto our salmon program. We talk about another species of fish called the negege. Uh, it's just spelled N-G-E-G-E. -E. It's a Swahili word uh, for cichlid. So it's a type of cichlid that we have here at the zoo. And they're, they're very endangered. And many of them have gone extinct from Lake Victoria in East Africa. So that's where those fish are from. And what's interesting is that Basically, the reason that population of cichlid has declined is the same reasons that our salmon populations have declined. They were fished too much, there was also invasive species introduced, and there was pollution in the lake. Uh, and all of those things made it really difficult for the cichlids to survive, which is very similar to uh, what happened with our Atlantic salmon species. So we talk about that, that other species uh, as well as our Atlantic salmon population to sort of draw those parallels that these two Great Lakes regions of the world, so the Great Lakes of North America and the Great Lakes of East Africa, are really far apart geographically, but really similar in a lot of the pressures and issues that they face. And they're very important freshwater ecosystems. So it's very important uh, to be aware of these issues and, and to do what we can to try to support them. So uh, the zoo supports a number of species at risk programs for uh, all sorts of different animals. Uh, different taxa, which are different groups of animals. Uh, so we have some different programs that support them, uh, starting with the Great Lakes program. So our salmon program kind of falls under our Great Lakes program umbrella. And actually, if I can get my, my lovely camera person, Michelle, to follow me this way, I can show you some information on this door here. So this is actually some of our information from our Great Lakes program and some of the other species at risk that we talk about in our program. So we've got freshwater mussels here uh, and the red side dace up there, uh, which are all native uh, to Ontario and Canada, and they are considered species at risk. So they are in danger to some level. They could be threatened, they could be special concern, they could be endangered, uh, or they could be extirpated, which means uh, extinct from a particular region, or they could be uh, totally extinct altogether. So those are sort of the the different categories of, of species at risk. So our Great Lakes program focuses on the aquatic species. And then we have other programs as well. We can go back over here to our salmon. We have some other programs as well that focus on other taxa. So our native bat conservation program. You might have guessed it focuses on bat species. So different bat species at risk in Ontario. And in our bat program, they're not raising bats in captivity, but they're studying bats. So we still don't know a lot about some of the species at risk bats here in Ontario and Canada. So we have a group of people um, that are trying to find that out, trying to find out more about bats even just in sort of the greater Toronto area and in sort of some more northern regions of Ontario. So they're out there doing research, surveying bats, 
uh, by sight, but also surveying them by sound. So they put these acoustic monitors out to try and capture the sounds the bats make to find out what species are where and when. So that's another program that's focusing on some species at risk in Ontario. And then uh, a third program that we have at the zoo that's focusing on Ontario species at risk is our Adopt-a-Pond program. And Adopt-a-Pond focuses on reptiles and amphibians of Ontario that are at risk to some degree. So turtles, frogs, and snakes for the most part. So they do similar things. They're, they do a lot of outreach. All three of our programs, the, the Bats, Great Lakes, and adopt a -Pond, do outreach. Um, we go to events. We do presentations. We're talking to people about these species. We produce resources about these species. And so adopt a -Pond does that as well. adopt a -Pond does research. So they do, uh, for example, they do surveys along roadways to see, it's not very much fun, but they go out there to look for, unfortunately, dead reptiles and amphibians, and they record that, because we don't really know a lot about how often animals die on the road. So they go and do that kind of research, and then they also go out and actually look for turtles and frogs, and listen for frogs, listen for their calls as well. So there's a lot going on here at the zoo to support local species at risk. And actually, I want to tell you a little bit more about another a project that adopt a -Pond is working on uh, to, to support species at risk, and that's our Blanding Turtle uh, Head Starting Program. So we are actually going to go to another space here at the zoo so that I can tell you about it and we can show you uh, what those Blanding Turtles look like. So we'll see you. All right, so here we are in our Blanding's room, our Blanding Turtle room, uh, and I want to talk to you about our Blanding Turtle Head Starting Program. So that's another one of our programs here at the zoo to help uh, support species at risk in Ontario. So here we are in the Blanding's Turtle Room. This is sort of the second stage of the Blanding's Turtle uh, rearing and reintroduction program. So we've got all these different black tubs in here that have the little juvenile Blanding's Turtles. So uh, my colleague Michelle, who's working the camera for me, is going to zoom in on the turtles so you can have a look at them while I tell you about the program. So the Head Starting Program, uh, Head Starting is uh, a term for many rear and release programs and it's a program where we're doing exactly that. We're raising juvenile turtles uh, from egg to two years in this case, two years of age, and then they're released back into the wild and this gives them a head start in life because juvenile animals of, of many species are very vulnerable when they're young and in particular they're vulnerable to predation or other types of environmental conditions so a lot of times they don't survive to maturity so this is one way that we can help give these animals a bit of a head start and ensure that they are surviving to at least two years of age which gives them a, a good chance to keep surviving once they're in the wild so the eggs uh, for these blanding turtles are collected from nature, from populations that are stable, that can handle us taking some of the eggs. And they're hatched here at the zoo, and they're actually hatched in an area that's publicly viewable. So you can see them if you go to our America's Pavilion. So they hatch out, and then they grow to about the size of a toonie, and then they get moved into this room uh, for their second year of life. And they come in here, and they're gonna keep growing and getting bigger, to about the size of uh, maybe your maybe my fist. That's about how big they get before they're released. And the way that we actually group them in these tubs, they're actually grouped by size. And that's very important. So we have turtles of similar sizes in the same tubs. And that's important because if we had a tub that had some really big turtles and some really small turtles, then those really big turtles would be a lot better at getting the food quicker that we put in for them, and they would just keep growing bigger and bigger, and the little ones wouldn't grow as quickly. So this way, we even that out so that all of our turtles grow and get big and strong before they're released into the wild. So you might be wondering what they eat. So they're fed crickets, and they're fed different types of small fish, and they're also fed something that's made here at the zoo called a gel. And we make lots of different gels here at the zoo for lots of different animals, and they're full of nutrients, uh, that help the animals grow and, and get all the nutrients that they need. So before these turtles go out into the wild, 
they're going to spend a little bit of time outside as well. So they'll move again for a third time into an outdoor enclosure, which exposes them to the sunlight and temperature fluctuations. And that way they can get used to that before they actually go uh, into the wild and, and into nature. So it's a whole process looking after these turtles. And of course, we would not be able to do this on our own. There are a lot of partners involved in this project. We have partners at different levels of government. We have different um, other non-governmental organizations, First Nations communities. Uh, lots and lots of people are involved in, in making this happen. And then once the turtles are released into the wild, we don't just release them and hope for the best. We follow them, we track them. So before they're released, we put a tiny little radio transmitter on them. It's very small. Probably about this big, maybe even a bit smaller. So it doesn't impact them when they're trying to move around and live their life. And our staff, they go out in the summer and they go out in the winter too and use a, a radio antenna to track the turtles. And they get really close to where they are and they hopefully, most of the time too, are able to actually see them. So they can see what the turtle's doing, uh, and they, they, they write down where it is and what the weather's like and what time of day it is and all of that important information that we gather and that helps us better understand these populations so we can better understand how to protect them in the wild. So this uh, Glanny's Turtle Project is just one example of some of the zoo's projects to help support species at risk. So we actually have a number of other projects. For example, our black-footed ferret uh, rearing and releasing program where we're doing the same thing. We're breeding uh, black-footed ferrets here at the zoo and then they get released into the prairies. Uh, the same thing with our Vancouver Island Marmot program. And there's other programs we work on too for, for different animals like um, snakes, for example. So the zoo is doing a lot to support all sorts of different species around the globe and of course right here at home, our, our own very own species at risk. Hello everyone, thanks for checking out this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I'm Johnny Nene. This week, we're going to look at a native fish species called the red side dace. Red side dace are a cool water minnow species. In Canada, they're only found in Ontario in streams that flow into Lake Simcoe, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and the western part of Lake Ontario. As their name suggests, Red side dace have a bright red stripe that runs about halfway down their body along with a thinner bright yellow stripe that extends to the tail. They can reach lengths of about 12 centimeters long and they have large mouths with protruding jaws that they use to help them catch insects from above the water surface. Red side dace are found in clear, cool flowing waters with varying substrates including silt, gravel, or stone. They are generally found in areas with overhanging grasses and shrubs. Red side dace eat insects and they have a super cool way for catching their prey. They can leap up to 10 centimeters out of the water to catch insects that are flying above the water's surface and they are the only fish in Canada with this unique ability. During spawning, Red side dace will use the nests that are constructed by other fish species like common shiner and creek chub and they rely on these species to guard their nest and eggs. Red side dace are incredibly sensitive to habitat disturbances and they are considered an indicator species. The term indicator species means that the status of a particular species reflects the changes or conditions in an ecosystem. Red side dace are listed as endangered in Canada and they are protected under the Species at Risk Act and Ontario's Endangered Species Act. Under the Endangered Species Act, a recovery strategy must be prepared for species that are listed as threatened or endangered and one was prepared for the red side dace back in 2010. Threats to red side dace populations are mainly from urban development and include pollutants from stormwater and agricultural runoff, habitat fragmentation caused by dams, and habitat degradation from artificial channelization and the removal of riparian vegetation. Currently, 
there are conservation efforts being carried out to try to help the red side dace, including captive breeding by the University of Windsor and habitat restoration initiatives by Ontario streams and conservation authorities. However, as most populations of red side dace are currently surrounded by urban development and will likely continue to be developed, the future of this unique fish is anything but certain. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed learning about the red side dace and that you can take away just how important it is to have quality habitat for our species. Thanks for checking out this week's segment of Fishy Facts. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you, Mary Kate, and thank you, Johnny. And thank you for watching week eight of the Bring Back the Salmon Classroom Hatchery program. Be sure to join us next week when we're going to be hearing from Brooke Schreier from the Invasive Species Awareness Program, and he's going to teach us about invasive species of the Lake Ontario watershed.